This, uh, this session is, is titled Options for Reform of Irish Elections and it's the list, the short list for, of four items that uh, the Convention decided should be examined in a bit more detail uh, at this meeting. And we're going to have a combination of David and Jane uh, present on them. So over to you. Thanks, Tom. So just yeah. to um, follow on from what Tom is saying to put a bit more context on this, as you will remember, one of the things you voted on last week was which four things would you like us to consider in a bit more detail now um, about other reforms to the electoral system. And basically it breaks down into three main parts. So I'm going to talk about the first part, which is possible reforms to our existing electoral system. And then I'm going to hand over to Jane, who's going to talk about the other two items, one of which is non-parliamentary ministers, the possibility of external ministers, which came up somewhat this morning, so she's going to talk about that. And, and the other is direct democracy, the right for citizens to petition for referendums or for legislation. So she's going to talk about that in a minute. So my topic for, the, for a couple of minutes, really, is to talk about possible reforms to our single transferable vote system. And just to put a bit of context on that point, um, you may remember the last time we met, there was some discussion about all sorts of possible ways you could change our existing electoral system. So at the end of the weekend, tomorrow, when the time comes for the ballot paper to be designed, um, it's likely that you're going to be deciding between do we keep the ele ex existing electoral system just as it is? Do we keep the existing electoral system but make some changes to it, your second option? Or your third option would be do we go for some kind of mixed member proportional system, which we'll yet have to find out what that might be. So in terms of that second option, the possibility of making changes to our existing electoral system, single transferable vote, that could be any number of things you might want to think about. It could be whether you um, change the way the ballot is, is structured. At present, as, as many of you will know, the candidates' names are listed alphabetically. Maybe there are different ways in which you could have a ballot paper done. But the two particular things you asked us to talk about, which is what I'm going to talk about now, are the size of our doll and the size of our constituencies. There are two possible changes that you could make which would have an impact on our existing electoral system. So let me spend a few minutes on each of those and then I'll stop and hand over to Jane. So the size of the doll is conditioned by the Constitution. Under the Constitution it says very clearly that um, there must be one doll deputy for between every 20,000 or 30,000 citizens. So that sets a constraint that if, you want, if we wanted to change the size of the doll, we would have to stay within that constraint that says for every doll deputy, there should be between 20,000 and 30,000 um, of the population, it's called, of, of, of the citizens effectively. And that, in fact, was what constrained the current government because the Fine Gael party in particular, in their manifesto, said that among the many reforms they wanted to bring in was to radically reduce the size of the doll, which is currently 166 members. But when the time came for them to look at it, what was realised is because of our existing population size, all they could do was reduce the size of the doll by eight. So in the next election, our doll uh, will be 100, I can't do my maths, 158 doll deputies. That's as, that's as low as they could take it because of the constitutional constraint of between one, or one TD for every 20,000 to 30,000. So in other words, if you really wanted to change the size of the doll radically, it would need a constitutional reform. And all I would say at this point is, just to put the question out there, actually, does the doll need to be reduced? I just want to put the question out there because it's worth saying. It's quite common to hear it on the airwaves all the time or in newspaper articles that our doll is too big. And so, for example, I repeatedly hear um, arguments being made about how the Dutch, in the Dutch, the, the Netherlands elects a, a parliament of 150, but they're a much bigger population. So their parliament is much smaller than ours. So clearly, doll Aaron is too big. Therefore, the argument is we could do with less doll deputies. Well, all I, all I would say to you is that there's not a simple relationship between the size of population and the size of your parliament. Imagine, imagine a country with only 500,000 citizens in it. Would we be saying that it only needs a parliament with two or three members? So it's clearly not a simple, as they say, linear relationship between the two. The relationship is, is quite more complex. And actually, there has been very detailed research done on this by two American political scientists looking at all the world's parliaments based on the size of the population. Uh, and they, they would locate Ireland exactly where it should be. 
So there is an argument to be made that our doll is not bigger than it needs to be, that actually the parliament that stands out as unusual in that analysis is the Dutch one. The Dutch parliament, according to their analysis, is too small. So that's the, all I want to say about the size of the doll. Of course it could be reduced, it would need constitutional reform, but actually there is an argument for saying it's about the right size. And one final thing about the size of the doll I wanted to say, is, because this came up in some of the discussion last time, is what about the more rural parts of the country? Uh, which have larger constituencies, and therefore this, it's, it's more difficult, the argument is, for the citizens to make contact with the politicians. It's more difficult for the politicians to get around the constituency because they're much larger. What about having more TDs in the more rural parts, particularly in the west of the country? And that's an argument that comes up from time to time. And all, all I'd say on that one is that that is a big no-no for the very simple reason that, you know, in, in any democracy, the argument is that all votes should have equal value. So a citizen voting in a Dublin constituency, the vote of that citizen should be electing proportionate to the population the same number of Dáil deputies as a citizen in the far west of the country. If you give more TDs to the west of the country, you're giving their votes a greater value because they're electing more TDs for their votes. So it's a big no-no. It's called malapportionment. It's a badly apportioned parliament if you have too many votes, too many TDs in the more rural areas. So I, I just wanted to raise that. So that's all I want to say on the size of the doll. It could be reduced. Does it need to be reduced? But if you were to reduce it, you need constitutional reform. And then just one sort of basic point about constituency size before I hand over to Jane. So the question is, should we change the size of our constituencies? At present, all that's said about that in the constitution is that our, const our constituencies must elect at least three doll deputies. And that's a basic, um, uh, requirement in any proportional system. You need at least three politicians to make your result reasonably proportional. But we tend to have very small constituencies. We're, we're among the smallest of all the proportional representation systems across the world. Our, on average, we have far more three or four seat constituencies than, than, than bigger ones. And there's no reason why it has to be like that. There is no need for constitutional reform here. The government, this government, could set in process um, um, uh, it could set things in process so that for the next election we have much larger constituencies if they wanted to, without changing the constitution. Why would they do that? If you have larger constituencies, you have much better proportionality. You will have more small parties winning, you will have more independents winning, you will have more women being elected to parliament. So there's a lot of positives about having bigger constituencies. The potential negative, of course, is that if you have bigger constituencies, the ballot paper is going to get very long, very complex and it's going to potentially confuse voters. So all I would suggest here, just to consider the point, is that there is a rule of thumb which says that if you have an average constituency size of about five, that you're electing five TDs on average across the country, that is seen as enough to get a reasonably proportional result. We never have that. We are always somewhere about four point something. So we could increase our constituency size just a little bit and get a much better result in terms of representation of women, representation of politicians if we wanted to do it, representation of small parties. But it does not require constitutional reform. So I'll hand over to Jane now to discuss the other two topics. Okay. So if we're going to talk first about the, the issue of having uh, different ministers, how we select a cabinet, which is one of the, the things that you, you asked about the, the last time we were here. And one of the, the biggest differences is actually between presidential systems and parliamentary systems. So if you look at the, the presidential system, Obama appointed Hillary Clinton uh, to be Secretary of State to fly all the way around the world. She was a senator for New York at the time, she had to, she could no longer be a senator, she was just a member of the cabinet. So there was, there's an absolute difference. And of course, as we heard earlier, um, Obama could also appoint somebody who is a Nobel laureate, whether or not he, he worked out. So the cabinet is entirely separate. They're not necessarily people who are elected. In parliamentary systems, it's much more likely that the members of cabinet will at some point have been um, elected. But as we'll see as I go through it, Ireland, along with the UK, because of course most of our political system we've actually copied from Westminster at some point. So Ireland and the UK are at one end of the, the extreme where all of our cabinet ministers are basically parliamentarians and, and have been elected through. So James Riley 
um, Minister for Health. He was a, an expert, whether or not it's working out, you, you heard about it earlier. Um, but he had to be elected a member of the, the Dáil, or at least the Shannad, before, before he could be uh, appointed to Cabinet. He couldn't just have been brought in by, by Enda Kenny without having been elected by the people first. Um, so, in, in this way, Ireland and the UK are really quite exceptional when it comes to um, how it works. In some countries, dual membership is prohibited. So, like in America, you cannot be a member of the House and a member of the Cabinet. So, you must resign. And that would be France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, and so on. In other countries, it's more of a sort of a halfway house where dual membership is permitted, but it's not required. So you can be both in the cabinet and be elected simultaneously, and that's most of the rest of Europe. And then you have, at the other extreme, Ireland and the UK, where by definition you have to be both at the same time. So we're the, the only two countries um, in Europe that do that. So if you look at it as kind of a continuum, we have Ireland and the UK here, where everybody has to be moving into sort of the middle, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Den Denmark, Iceland, and then what John Coakley calls a semi-parliamentary system, Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Austria, and, and France, where they're totally separate. So you can see there's kind of a, a continuum there of where it happens. Now, of course, even in the places where ministers are totally separate, it turns out that most of them ha at some stage have been elected anyway. I think on average uh, across Europe, it's, I think uh, John Coakley found it was about 80% have been elected at some stage anyway. But it's just when they are actually ministers, they cannot uh, be there at the same time. So there's great variation in that in, uh, in terms of the European um, experience. If we look back to, to where we were in the 1922 <laughs> constitution, um, Michael Collins initially had a, a, a drafting group of, of non-TDs who came up with it, and the original idea in, in the 1922 constitution would be that we'd have four central ministers who would have to be elected, and that would be the Taoiseach, the Minister for Finance, the Minister for Foreign Affairs, then called External Affairs, and the President. And that the other eight, there would have been 12 altogether, the other eight would be non elected people. They would be people who'd be brought in for their specialisms or their, their interests or whatever. It was changed then, so two could be um, from within the door. But it didn't last very long as a committee came along then of, um, of TDs, and so they changed it from that you actually had to have people from outside to you could have people from outside, so that did away with it altogether, you know, when the, the kind of the could rather than have was introduced uh, by legislation. And then in the 1937 constitution, the whole idea of external ministers was dropped altogether, except that you could have two from the, Sha from the Shannad. So the, the last one of those was actually the, the guy on the bottom here, um, uh, Jim Duke, who Ga Gard Fitzgerald brought into the Shannad and then um, made a minister but it hasn't happened since. In the UK, actually, it happens a little bit more. So, for example, Peter Mandelson would have been the last one. Blair would have made him a lord and then brought him in, into uh, the cabinet. Now, there's all question marks. Well, like, who is brought in? So the one that you hear about all the time is, well, at the last government, if we'd had external ministers, wouldn't we have had Shawnee Fitz as the, the Minister for Finance? <laughs> so uh, that's why you see a picture of, uh, of Shawnee Fitz up, up there. Um, so, you know, th th that, is, uh, that is quite possible, but then others would say, well, sure, we might as well have had him. So, um, um, De Valera's point of view was all ministers should be dull deputies. They should be answerable to the electorate. Okay, so that's the basic idea that, you know, everybody, if everybody is, a, is in the door, then they're answerable, and that's why we want all ministers to be it. But the other side of it is, you know, why should... 10,000 voters in North Dublin have any more influence on health policy than any other voter anywhere else in the country? Or why should some 1,000 voters in Dunleary have any more influence on foreign policy than any other voter in the country? So, and then finally, I'd say when you're thinking about it, if you go back to the 1922 experience, there's a big difference between permitting and requiring. So you can permit the, the cabinet to have external ministers, 
and then it may or may not happen, or you can require them to have external ministers, which will, which will be a, a much bigger difference. So anyway, those are hopefully the, the basics of the, the pros and cons of having external or independent ministers. So then after that, the, the other thing that you, um, that you asked that we talk about this week was uh, direct democracy. Now, that, it's not the political party that you might have seen run in, in, in Meath East. It's, um, you know, they, they just happen, happen to have the name. So direct democracy is, it's set up as a difference, as the polar opposite of representative democracy. So in representative democracy, you elect people to then go and vote and take decisions on your behalf. So you elect a TD, he or she then goes into the doll and uh, will vote and take decisions on your behalf. In direct democracy, you, the people, are asked to make the decisions. So lots of us are pretty time poor. We don't necessarily have the inclination to want to be burning up on, on every subject. So representative democracy um, makes sense in most countries in the world. But it isn't actually sort of polar opposites like that. It's not, you know, people sort of say it's sort of Janus faced. It's not necessarily that you can have a continuum of it and you have to think of it in two different ways. So in one way, you can have top-down representative democracy. So that's what we already have. So last week, the Taoiseach told us we're going to have a referendum on the, on the Shannon ab abolition. So that's top-down. That's the executive telling us that we can have a vote probably sometime in October on whether or not to abolish the Shannon. Yeah. So the other way you can have direct democracy is bottom-up. So that's when you would actually go and you would get enough signatories and you would say to the government, OK, I've got this amount of signatories now. You must allow me to have a referendum on something to change the constitution, or you must allow me to make proposals to, to change legislation. OK, so that's the, the kind of bottom-up part of direct democracy. So that's really what we're talking about today, because we already have the top-down. We already have the referendums that the government can give us. So the question is, do we want more of the bottom-up, the initiatives where we can gather signatories and ask for um, and ask for changes? OK, so why would you bother with direct democracy? Well, one of the reasons across the world we see more referendums and more initiatives everywhere, and one of the main reasons is also partly the reason that we're actually sitting in this room today is to do with the kind of the, the declining levels of trust in political institutions and in political parties in particular. So you see there the smallest blue line in the middle is the trust in political parties right the way across Europe. That's uh, the Eurobarometer. And the biggest one is in local public authorities and in things that, so where people, where it's smaller, where people feel closer, they have much greater levels of trust. So the idea is if you bring policy to the people, if you allow them a greater say in initiatives and so on, that you might build up trust in the, in the political system. So that's why people, that's why there is an emphasis on this. Whether or not it works is open to question and open to debate. Um, where it does happen, um, is in Switzerland. So Switzerland is very much at, at one extreme. And uh, actually, Francis down the back was uh, reminding me of the, the example of the, the absolute extreme, which, uh, bear with me with the pronunciation, Francis, but it's a, a panzal in a rodent. Is that, yeah? And uh, so what they do, they have such direct democracy that once a year they all go in the, in the square and the men dressed in medieval costume and the men raise their swords if they want to vote for something or, or not. And um, it was actually 1991 before they gave women the, the vote. Um, and they still have no separation of powers. So that's one extreme of, uh, of direct democracy. But of course, you know, a lot of other Swiss cantons are, are nowhere near so, uh, so as extreme as that. That's one of the more conservative, more um, Catholic cantons in, in Switzerland. And then you have California, where hundreds of things are put on the ballot all the time. You, you have, basically, if you want something to be put as an initiative, you have to go out and collect the required number of signatories, and then there's a number of processes you go through, and lawyers suggest wordings and so on. And it's difficult enough to get through, but nonetheless, you can have eight or ten things on a ballot paper at any one time. Anything from, you know, legalizing man marijuana to, you know, how you treat your pets to abortion. You know, it doesn't really, all sorts of things can um, go on at the, at the one time. 
In Europe, we have um, a kind of a, a European citizens initiative. So this is Europe's first bid at, at you know, trying to reach out and try to get Europe closer to the citizens. So here you have to get like a million signatories across a, a number of different countries. And then basically your proposal is put into the commission and you get to speak to parliament and, you know, and this kind of thing. You obviously don't get a Europe-wide referendum or whatever, but it's still this, the same kind of idea that you can have this initiative that you're giving some power to the people to be able to uh, come back and uh, get involved in, in policy. And again, just to go back quickly to the 1922 constitution, it had three different proposals in it. So it had referendums, which we still have. It allowed a veto of legislation. So if the government put forward legislation, if you got enough signatories within 90 days, you, they would have to undo it, so long as it wasn't a money bill. And then they also had initiatives where basically you had to get 50,000 signatories across a range of constituencies, and then you could demand that something would be looked at by Parliament, and if they hadn't fixed it within two years, it would have to go to, um, to referendum. So like the thing with the external ministers in the 1922 constitution, that was also amended and then dropped by the, by the 1937 constitution. So it was something that was in there in the beginning and was kind of inspired by the direct democracy in, in Switzerland. So why would we do it? Why would we say, look, we want some initiatives, we want some more direct democracy? Well, it restores some authority to the people, yeah? makes them more responsible. Um, so, but on the other side, of course, you know, then special interests can, can also get, get involved and, and money and so on. Um, so it curbs the, the imbalance of power, makes politicians more responsible and accountable to the people rather than just infrequent elections. Okay, especially if you have ones which aim to um, influence legislation rather than necessarily a change of the constitution. And there is evidence that people, especially from California, that people can actually have eight or ten things on the ballot paper at one time and can understand them. Um, and so it keeps people engaged with policy when there's these kind of debates going on rather than just ignoring things unless there happens to be a big referendum or an election. Um, but then the other problem is you can, of course, vote for two different things. So in California, they can vote, and did actually a couple of years ago, they voted for um, no new taxes and to raise spending. And yet the state wasn't allowed to go bankrupt. And, you know, so there was actually a huge problem with the budget. They couldn't balance it. They'd actually voted for two completely contradictory things. Now, the Swiss actually have a, have a sort of a, a tie break in there. So if one wins, then what would you do with the other? That's how they deal with that one. And then a lot of people argue that in a, a small country like Ireland, we don't need this kind of thing. You know, we're, we're close to all our politicians. We know them. If there's a big movement and people are really feeling something strongly, all they have to do is tune into Joe Duffy and, you know, they'll hear about it. So, you know, why do we need this whole palaver of signatories and and that kind of thing, you know, that um, it's a step too far for a small country like, the, like us. And then lastly, people wonder, well, are voters actually up to direct democracy? You know, how bored would you be? The, the Swiss go three times a year for referendums and kind of anything from two to ten things on each time. So would you want to be going to the, to the polls and listening to all that debate two or three times a year for all these different things? Would it decrease turnout? There's some evidence that it does in some places. Um, and would you actually engage with it, or would you just vote off the top of your head? Would you actually sit down and listen to the arguments and, and come to an informed decision? You know, the, the jury is out on that. Sean Bowler in California would tell us absolutely that it's a great thing, and other people would tell us that no, I, I, people would just vote the way their union tells them to, or the political party they like, or the GAA or whatever other group they're kind of involved in, that they won't involve themselves in the debates. So again, the jury is kind of out on that. Um, so I suppose, what are we really talking about here? I suppose we're talking about two things. Do we want the possibility for uh, citizens to be able to go and gather enough signatories, however many it is, whatever conditions we put in about numbers of constituencies, to be able to make a change in the constitution? And or do we want them to be able to petition the Dáil for some legislation, so something less than actually changing the constitution, but to be able to petition the Dáil? So those are probably the, the two things that we're talking about here. Okay, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks very much.
And David, I, I think again that there's been pretty clear expositions of these four uh, issues and, and the options that we have in thinking about them. So the floor is open. Yeah, Katrina. Just um, a quick question, not necessarily in relation to the presentations, because I think they were very clear, um, but I thought uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, we agreed that we were also going to put quite a focus on looking at how we maximise uh, turnouts and administration of elections. And, and I'm just wondering, I saw the programme tomorrow, um, it's fairly packed, it doesn't seem to be dealing with that, or maybe we are planning to do it there. But I, I do think, regardless of what system uh, we go for, the, the, it has to go hand in hand with maximizing participation, getting people on the electoral register, yeah. citizen uh, awareness and education. Thank you. Yeah, we are actually beginning to deal with this later on, uh, already today, and we may come back to it tomorrow. Michelle. <coughs> Um, thank you, and thanks for the presentations in the morning and, and the afternoon. Um, just to say, um, I'm a bit disappointed at the exposition of issues surrounding size of constituencies and number of TDs. It's an issue, as you know, I, I raised at the last uh, convention meeting, um, particularly in relation to Article 16, um, which directs pretty much that the number of TDs in a constituency is proportionate, as you had described, David, to the, uh, the, um, the number of population between 20 and 30,000. And um, at that point, um, and, and I suppose what I'm disappointed at today is that really all you've said to us, it's a no-no and it's malapportionment and all the rest. And, and I, I do understand what that means, but what I, my argument is that actually malapportionment that you refer to and um, you know, it being a no-no because obviously the other is, is a more straightforward way, it does not take into account uh, of other factors. And we know that some of these other factors are recognised in other countries. In our neighbouring country in the UK, we know that, uh, as I said before, that an MP rep representing a London constituency will have a lot more constituents than somebody representing the Outer Hebrides. Now, if we go to the reality on the ground which has happened with the reduction of ATDs, and it's not so much about the numbers of TDs, but how the TDs are allocated around the constituencies. Of the eight gone, five are from the far, the rural constituencies or constituencies with a broad geographical spread. So you have going from Curry, uh, Donegal, Mayo, Tipperary, uh, and you have uh, Cavan Monaghan. Now, you know, I think you cannot, you know, I know maybe um, people are more used to conveniences, especially in urban areas. But I think you just cannot underestimate, first of all, infrastructure. And we know that there's been a deficit in infrastructure investment in these rural areas, sometimes because of peripherality, etc. So they already have that issue. You have an issue in relation to TDs getting around those constituencies. In my own, it would take me on a good day two hours to go from one end to the other. Uh, but that's just the TD. Uh, constituents are in a situation in rural areas, they don't have public transport, uh, many areas don't have broadband, so there's a communications deficit. Uh, and aside from that, from the economic point of view, we know, for example, in the border, middle and western region, that in relation to economic indicators, that we know that uh, in terms of um, people's standard of living, incomes they enjoy, etc., they're a lot lower than in other areas. And I just think that I would have liked to have seen something showing how they get about uh, uh, get to a point, say, in the UK, where they can recognise these as issues. Um, and if I might just throw another thing into it, uh, which is another situation which has been thrown up uh, by the most recent boundary changes uh, for the Doyle elections. Um, and that is, you know, fragments taken of constituencies to make up populations where, for example, in the Sligo constituency, you have a bit of South Donegal, you have a bit of Cavan gone into it, and you have Roscommon. So, you know, it really doesn't seem to respect the integrity or the pride, the civic pride that there is in county. And I'm not saying it has to be consistently that, but it seems to fracture it. So people are in one area for a, a local authority, they're in another area. And I know maybe in the cities it can be a bit different and, and maybe that's all, that already exists. But I, I definitely think that it's been, it's been glossed over. And it is an issue, it's a very real issue for people out there, and in particularly in those constituencies I'm referring to, and I see a democratic deficit where, where, 
We're losing councillors. We're losing councils, potentially the, the Shannad. So the power base is shipped into the urban areas. And yet all the services are in the urban areas. And from, you know, even down to your, your citizens' advice, you might be hard pressed to get it in some of these okay, towns I think, and villages. Michelle, we we so, have your point, basically. Yeah, well, okay. I, I'm just disappointed uh, yeah. that, that this hasn't been covered or we have no comparison like we've seen in, in relation to other issues for, okay. uh, that, that we've discussed. Okay, thank you very much. We will we, we come back to that in, in a moment, I think. Uh, Tom. Uh, Tom Burke, Chairman. Uh, I don't agree with Michelle that the geographical spread is as big an issue as she makes out. Right, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you had no telecommunications. You had very poor uh, roads. Nobody had a car. It was an issue then that the TD needed to be in every corner every week. But it's not the issue now, with the same issue, with access to telecommunications. Everybody has their mobile phone. They can phone, they can write, they can drive. You know, it's, it, it is maybe an issue, but not as big an issue, I think, as Michelle is making. But the point I really wanted to make was, um, Article 48 of the 1922 Constitution provided for direct democracy. And given the issues that are referred to poor roads, poor transport and everything back then, I think the minimum number of uh, voters required to call for a referendum was excessive. And again, with the EU numbers, one million signatures, uh, is unrealistic. If we are going for direct democracy, the numbers required to call for a referendum should be meaningful. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Pat. Uh, Chairman Pat Hunt here again. Just a question for Jane. It's in relation to the, just a number of questions in relation to the one million signatures. Just harking back to what Tom says, it's, it's a pretty unrealistic figure here in Ireland based on the, the fact of our population. But equally as well, is that one million a case of one million citizens of the country, or one million inhabitants of a country? Is it a case of one million people that are on the electoral register? It, it opens up a whole Pandora's box of questions in relation to how you would actually achieve this. And again, as Tom rightly said a few moments ago, in relation to holding a referendum or indeed from the grassroots up promoting it to central government, a realistic figure would have to be examined and agreed, first of all, at central level, but equally as well. It's a case as well that what caveats must be tied to that? Tied to that would it be a case of is this confined just to citizens of the state, registered voters of the state, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a lot of you know nitty gritty that would have to be sorted out before you'd actually proceed with it. Okay, thanks, Susan. Uh, thank you, David. It would appear, perhaps, from the um, explanation you gave about making the constituencies larger, that it answers actually a lot of the questions that people were looking for. You know, more independence, more women, perhaps more proportionality. Um, and yet, as Michelle has said, um, in the way the constituencies were, were redrawn, uh, in fact, it's Sligo, Leitrim, South Donegal and West Cavan rather than Roscommon. But, but the point being that people actually don't like uh, when you redraw constituencies and people lose their county boundaries. People feel very, very strongly about it. And in fact, that constituency feels like it was the leftovers of the rest of the country when they were trying to make up the numbers. I think it's the only constituency in Ireland that has four counties in it represented in the one constituency. But I'm interested to know if there's been any research or has anyone actually drawn or redrawn a map of Ireland that would show us what it actually looked like? And has there been any research into how citizens would respond to bigger constituencies? That while they give the results you refer to, people might go mad and say, here, no, we don't want to be put in with our neighbouring counties. Yeah. So if there's any research for that. I mean, this is a classic example, I think, of where there are serious trade-offs. Because on the one hand, with bigger constituencies, you're clearly getting greater proportionality. On the other hand, you'll be introducing elements, such as you mentioned, which people don't like. So basically, this is the dilemma, I think. David, would you like to respond to the various questions that have been commented, including, obviously, Michelle's, who raised that, indeed, the last, that question the last day. And um, yeah. you, you, you were very categoric about that. I'll, I'll have a go at some of them, I and mean, some of them related more to Jane. Yeah, of course. And yeah, sure. uh, one or other of Michaels may yeah. want to come in as well, yeah. particularly relating to Michelle's question, because yeah. that's my view. Let's see what they have to say and see if they differ. And I'll, I'll, let me try it another way. The reason why malapportionment is a bad thing, among other reasons, 
is because if you allow for that possibility of constituencies to be uneven in terms of population size, you bring in the possibility that some parties are favoured. So let me give you one idea here. The parties of the left do better in urban areas than they do in rural areas. So if you're giving more doll seats to rural areas than is allowed for in terms of population size, if you're giving them an imbalance of seats, you're favouring parties of the right. Whether, you, whether, whether that's your intention or not, I know it's not your intention, that's what would happen. And that is why it's a big no-no. What you have to have is a fair balance, one vote, one value, that uh, a vote in whatever most urban area you can pick should, have, should be electing as closely as possible the same number of representatives as a vote in the most rural part of the constituency. That's just the way it is done. And I'll let the Michaels come in on that one if, they, um, if, if, they, if there's a different nuance to what I'm, to what I'm saying. But to an extent, what, what you're getting at and what Susan getting, getting at also addresses some of the things that's going to come up later when we hear from Michael Marsh about, um, and Katrina had asked us that whether this was coming up, and it is coming up, about how we might reform how elections are done. And a lot of the issues about constituency boundaries and the size of constituencies and the shape of constituencies is better done if it's done by an independent body, an electoral commission. Set up a professional electoral commission make sure it's got, it's got the right kind of expertise in there to, to do the proper kind of analysis, the mapping that needs to be done, to see how you might come up with constituency boundaries that are, are, you know, are considered better by the local population. And, and a lot could be done alone just by doing that. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say for now. Okay. Okay. Um, I think in terms of the numbers, the million wasn't for Ireland, the million was for the whole of Europe. Um, so you needed to have people from at least seven member states. So you would only need a minimum of 9,000 in Ireland out of the million, and that was to get things to the EU. Um, in terms of the 1922 constitution, it was 50,000. And I suppose it would be up to people to think about what would be the appropriate number. But um, I think with social media and the internet now, the possibility of getting 50,000 signatories in Ireland doesn't seem um, especially onerous. If, if you had an awful lot less, then there's probably, you know, th there'd have to be a balance between sort of the completely frivolous likely to get on compared with, you know, make it, making it uh, possible for the, the required number of signatories to, to be gathered. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, just on a point of information, I'm not certain about this, but maybe one of you can elucidate on it. Am I right in thinking that the Supreme Court has already adjudicated on the issue that Michel has raised, that requiring that all citizens be treated equally? Well, in fact, the Constitution <clears throat> does say that the ratio of uh, population to TDs must be, I think the phrase is, as far as practicable, uh, the same throughout the country. So a scheme brought in in 1961 to redraw the constituencies was struck down by the Supreme Court on that basis, and they implied a kind of tolerance of plus or minus 5%. Right. So to change that would need a change to the Constitution. OK, OK. Let's go back there. We'll take another couple of questions. We have time for them. But Andrew and then uh, who's over there? Catherine, is it? Or? No, well, Tom has already spoken on this group. So uh, Andrew, please. Um, I, I, the, the question may have been answered. Just on the direct uh, democracy, is it a requirement to have uh, um, digital signatures are adequate. If you take California and so on, there's clearly a big difference between getting manuscript and, and typically is it technically allowable to use just digital signatures and get Facebook hits and all that kind of stuff or do you require manual signatures? That's the first question. And the, the only other point, uh, it was really just a comment. Uh, I, was, I liked the, the idea that the difference between requirement and, and being permitted and uh, as a general uh, uh, direction, I think anything that allows, that permits um, things to be done, to be brought into account, I think is a good thing because my experience is that politicians, where they can find a reason for not doing things because it's not permitted, they'll usually invoke that uh, lack of permission. So giving permission, whether it's then used or not, I think is, 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 is a good way to go. And I was interested to see that that was uh, in the 1922 uh, provisions. Thank you. Okay, and I'm not sure, was, was, was Susan's question answered about is there any research done about the, uh, about the uh, con constituency size, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. not aware specifically of any research that's been done, but I'm, I'm looking at Michael here in case he is. 
Um, well, no, I think the, the problem is we, we want so many things from the constituency configurations. We want, probably most people, I get the sense, want perhaps larger constituencies, five members or so. We want, again, not, not everyone, but most people seem to want more or less the same ratio of population to TDs across the country or something close to that. And we want county boundaries respected. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, we just can't have all those three simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So there are trade-offs and if we were to have county boundaries uh, respected, then uh, some counties would be relatively overrepresented, others would be underrepresented. So with 26 uh, counties, or even more if you count the fragmentation of uh, Dublin, for example, 26 counties anyway, and only maybe 40 or so constituencies, uh, it's simply impossible to meet all those criteria simultaneously. Oh, that's what the Big five, five seater constituencies. I'm going to take the map of Ireland and I'm going to try it out and see what it looks like. I just wondered whether somebody in an academic capacity might have tried it out to see what it looked like and went, oh no, that's a disaster. Um, because yes. it does sound like a good solution. Yeah, yes, in fact, there is an academic, John Coakley of UCD, who worked out a scheme under which, in fact, there would be bigger constituencies. They might be eight, nine, or ten, but they would remain fixed over time. There wouldn't be the need for constant redrawing of boundaries, and all that might change is that if population grew or, or shrunk, then what was an eight-seat constituency might go to nine or it might go to seven, and he makes the point that's what happens in Norway, for example, where the, the, the number of administrative units is just about the right number so that they, they remain constant as the electoral constituencies over time and all that changes is the number of seats that each one gets, whereas at present in Dublin particularly, many voters would be confused as to where one constituency ends and the next one begins and that line will vary from one election to, to another as, as constituency boundaries are redrawn. Okay, could we come back then to and answering Andrew's question? Yeah, um, there's different rules in different states in, in America. A lot of them uh, will allow digital signatures, but they need to be uh, verified digital ones, and you need to give in your um, ID that you can, you know, they then do random sampling to make sure that um, all of those people are, you know, do actually exist and are at the addresses they give and so on. Um, but I don't know of anywhere that allows Facebook likes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Well, look, I think we've, we've come to the end of our time allocation for this topic. We, I think we just have to move on because you're now going back into, um, into roundtable discussion. And obviously, part of what you'll be doing is, is reflecting on what you've just heard after lunch. And of course, you may be continuing your conversation from this morning. So we go until a, a quarter to four, and at which time we have a break. Thank you.